hillside in the Ammon Valley, South Wales. On it is one of British Coal's modern drift mines, landscaped to match the countryside. On the hillside now, there is only a ventilation inlet in local stone. This marks the spot where an environmentally acceptable method to sink a shaft was used. A 30 meter high Titan, operated by the Tisson Piggott Consortium as an alternative to the old drill and blast method. In mid-August 1985, work on site started. The first turf was cut for the topsoil to be removed over the whole site area. On the principle of what was removed must be restored, all topsoil was stockpiled on one side until the end of the job. In an effort to minimize what would be a sea of mud, the whole area was paved with hard core and chippings. The shaft was to be sunk here. The first section would be a 20 meter fore shaft. Working below the temporary collar and safety barrier, the method was drill and blast for the fore shaft with ladder access. would be mucked out using cactus grabs and kibbles hoisted by the crane. Temporary support of the excavation would be provided by rock bolts and mesh installed during sinking, to be followed by a concrete lining behind cast iron segments. Concrete was supplied ready mixed and skipped into place. This foreshaft would serve to submerge the Titan assembly and establish the reverse mud circulation. The initial excavation was secured by the concrete lining and once the rig slab was complete, the erection of the rig could go ahead. Prefabricated units of the Titan rig and its substructure are assembled on site by a team of eight men and a crane of 130 ton capacity, the whole operation taking two days. Accurate location of the unit is essential to ensure the rig lines up precisely over the foreshaft. The rotary ring and dual drive motors are mounted on the 30 ton main rig base frame on which is also fixed the winch unit. This is accurately positioned on top of the substructure. The rotary drive plate is in two halves to enable the assembly to be brought to the surface. The Titan has a three-sectioned mast, these making the largest dimensioned units to be transported to site. The total derrick height is 24 meters above the drilling deck, the final lift being the crown block, an awkward lift at full radius and height of the crane. It is 18 tons weight. At Betos, once the crown block was in place, the bottom hole equipment was quickly assembled through the open side of the mast. The assembly was to be completed with the attachment of the drilling bit. This was a conical center pickup bit, 3.75 meters in diameter. The bit had arrived on site and was put on the trolley to be slid under the close coupled stabilizer. Dowels set in the flange are the means of accurate location. Flange diameter was three meters. Secure bolting is essential and was carried out with an air-operated impact tool with final tightening using a purpose-built torque wrench. So, the bottom hole assembly consisted of the drilling bit, the close coupled stabilizer, four drill weights, the substructure beam partially obstructing one of them here, and above these drill weights, a non-rotating stabilizer, then finally the flange adapter, the blue section below the traveling block. 
The whole assembly suspended was 180 tons and it would occupy 19 meters of 3.75 meter diameter shaft. Owing to the hard pennant sandstone, the assembly was equipped initially with tungsten carbide cutters. On lowering the assembly into the shaft, the final operation was to bolt six of these spring pads to the non-rotating stabilizer core. Stabilizer design is such that directional stability of the assembly is not affected by minor irregularities in the board profile of the shaft. Drilling would carry on to full depth, 219 meters. Later, it would be linked up with a new ventilation roadway. The drill rig is powered by electro-hydraulic power packs with the primary electrical supply being provided by four 250 kVA generators. The hydraulic pumps they operate supply the fluid to both rotary and winch motors. Maximum speed of the rotary drive is 20 revolutions per minute in either direction. Reverse circulation mud flush is employed, achieved with a submersible pump mounted in the drill string. The electrical swivel for the submersible pump is positioned immediately below the mechanical swivel. Circulation of some 12,000 litres per minute is carried from the mechanical swivel through the large diameter wash pipe. Mud is taken away from the rig to the mud plant. Primary solids removal is achieved by screening through milkhem shakers. Solids emerge reasonably dry and drop into a pit for loading. Secondary cleaning is by a combination of hydrocyclones and fine screens. A small amount of storage capacity is maintained in a surface tank. Drill pipe used on the Titan is in six meter lengths bolted together with flanged connectors. Adding a length of pipe involves pulling up the string until the upper flange below the Kelly bar passes through the rotary table. Rig slips were set and the flange between pipe and Kelly bar was unbolted and the Kelly hoisted up a short distance. incoming length was handled in the horizontal position. A gasket was applied to the upper flange and the rig hoisted the Kelly bar up for the new length to go under it. Pipe flanges were rebolted. top of the new length, the same procedure was carried out with Kelly bar and pipe. The drill string was raised just enough to lift the slips for the string to be lowered to re-engage the Kelly bar on the table. Drilling recommenced. The survey technique employed at Betus involved the use of the Sperrysun multi-shot method. In this, a camera is lowered as part of the survey assembly. The picture is taken of an inclinometer showing the direction and inclination of the tool every six meters. A series is taken, both descending and ascending the drill pipe. Unlike oil techniques where the tool goes down the finished hole, the large diameter of the shaft means that the survey has to be done in the drill pipe.
Once the survey had been run, the individual frames were analysed and raw data processed to give position and direction of the bottom of the hole relative to the starting point on the surface. Accuracy was all the more important owing to the excessive deviation experienced. After a manually produced report on site, the results were computer processed and corrected off-site. Corrective measures had to be applied before the casing was run. Earlier in the project, the casing units made off-site were concreted, the ready-mix concrete being placed between inner and outer skins to form a structural member. Casings were paired to give six metre lengths. Welding the pairs was done, first of all internally, by means of a butt weld. Externally, the weld was a fillet. On completion of drilling, the rig was removed and casing could be run, the paired units being brought close to the shaft top. They weighed approximately 30 tonnes per six metre length. A welding cage was inserted loosely into the unit to give welders inside access for finishing work on the butt. The unit was brought over to be added to the survey centering frame. Then this assembly was presented to the previous casing length already in the shaft. The centering trolley enables the casing to be orientated and directionally aligned, thus ensuring that the full length of casing will be perfectly straight. To ensure an even weld gap, the casing unit was rotated to find the best possible fit. Welding commenced with the root for the butt weld. Duct and exhaust fan removed the welding fumes. Then came the external fillet weld. Hand welding with low hydrogen rods was used throughout. Non-destructive testing on welds was done at random on a certain number of welds. With completion of welding, the top clamps were fitted to the new unit. Now the casing could be lifted for the removal of the lower clamps. <coughs> Wires from the strain gauges positioned at intervals on the casing could now be extended upwards and securely attached to the grout monitoring pipes. Thus a close check on loadings could be made. The casing was flooded with water as part of the installation method. Designed to resist full hydrostatic load, it was floated in like a ship. This way, the 1,200 tonne weight was handled by a 110 tonne crane. Hence, no heavy lifting gear. And so on, all the way down. Once the casing had been installed, grouting could start. The two constituents of the grout were fly ash and cement, which were mixed on site in colloidal mixers. The grout was introduced into the annular space between casing and bored hole. Thus, the shaft was lined. The final connection between completed shaft and the mine workings, a connecting drivage, was advanced by drill and blast to link with this, the first drilled shaft for British coal, and the first one in Europe for a decade. The land above the shaft has been restored, the topsoil back in place to the same profile as before. It is pasture land again. <laughs>